Hi. Um, so we're a little bit earlier stage than Kieran, but um, I'll give it my best shot anyway. And uh, first thing I'd like to do is just maybe mention a few things that hopefully resonate with people. So if you've ever found yourself with a sick child late at night and not knowing where the nearest open pharmacy is, locament could be for you. Or if you've ever been driving down the countryside and suddenly noticed, God, we're running low on fuel here, uh, where's the nearest petrol station? Locament is for you. Or if you've just found you've been really frustrated playing on your uh, smartphone looking for uh, playing with a, a retailer's uh, store locator, then Localment is definitely for you. So what do we do? Localment helps consumers find local retailers. So that sounds simple, and it is simple. But if you think about it, it's what consumers really want in a retail context. They want to know where it is and is it open or not. So uh, what we've done is we've basically built a a centralized store locator with all the leading retailers, opening hours and location information built into that um, and made it really, really easy for consumers to search that and, and, and find the information they need. Um, we've also opened it up to uh, independent retailers to add their own details and uh, they do that on a daily basis. So basically from within the Locament app or website you can find details for about 400,000 stores um, across four different countries. Um, and without ever going past maybe two pages, two screens. Um, so uh, we've, we've been quite successful in getting users. Last month we had 1.5 million unique users um, access locament across uh, US, Ireland, uh, UK and Australia. And um, this, this, this obviously generates a huge, a huge amount of uh, data. So uh, aside from the challenge we have of, of gathering data, and uh, packaging it in a in really searchable, easily searched format, and um, uh, managing and maintaining that data, which is a, a big challenge. We also generate a lot of uh, data. Our users um, using our application generate a lot of data around the world. Um, so for example, the nature of the product uh, lends itself beautifully to people. Um, we, we know where they are, what they want, and when they want it. So that really lends itself beautifully to uh, something like uh, user demand heat maps, so consumer demand heat maps essentially. So in a, if I take an example of Dublin and pharmacies, we can potentially map out the user demand across the city and plot that against where there's existing pharmacies located and identify where there is local demand, significant local demand not being met by local supply. Um, very handy if you want to uh, open a pharmacy. So there's things like that that we can do and uh, that's hopefully going to feed into our business model going forward. Uh, in terms of relevant public information, um, what, the most obvious one we'd like to get our hands on is uh, store details or location details for on post. Um, they, for some reason they've encrypted their website. <laughs> which makes it very difficult for us to access that data, um, which is unfortunate because we, we do have US Postal Service, um, Post Office in the UK and Australia Post. Um, so that's something we've, we've been in discussions with them, but uh, yet unresolved. Um, there's a, a, also other um, public bodies such as um, the Department of Social Welfare and HSC and something like Heritage Ireland where we would like to get our hands on tourist um, tourist attractions, opening hours, that type of thing, very useful for us and for our users. Um, we were asked to give a little bit of advice to other startups, and I have to be honest, when I saw that on the email, I just thought normal advice to startups, but it's only dawned on me when I was do, listening to Kieran, I was there, it's probably data for, <laughs> data related for, for startups. So what I would say on that front is, um, what we would recommend is starting small because if you go back to the beginning of Locument, the very first website, it wasn't actually called Locument, but the very first web website we put up literally had a, about a dozen um, pharmacies opening hours and location information on it and it was just one page of text. And that attracted an awful lot of uh, users. I mean, we were blown, I, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't actually involved at the time, but was blown. we were blown away by the uh, the traction we got with that limited amount of data. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So just, uh, just a, a, a quick reminder, um, if you're looking for opening hours or location information, please check out Locument at locument.com or search for Locument on the app stores. Thanks a million. Thanks.
Thanks a lot, Oshin. So next up, we have Vinnie Quinn from Evercam. Good afternoon. Um, so we live in a world surrounded by cameras. There's cameras all over the place. Whether we like them or not, whether we agree with them or not, in general, we're not going to get any less of them. There's more of them. People have them in their pockets. They're uh, on every new device that we buy, and they're in, in public. And Evercam is a platform for managing cameras. And the idea is that you can take uh, camera data and make it easier to share either the, the data or share the actual access to the cameras with individuals, whether it's within an organization or within a family or whatever it might be. A lot of people have different camera streams in their lives. And it might be that you've got some in the office, you've got some in work, you might have one looking at your favorite surfing spot, your favorite, uh, you know, people have been looking at elderly parents, looking at kids in creches. The first public cameras, the first kind of webcams that were ever made public were for really basic functional community sharing purposes. I think the first one ever was looking at a coffee machine in one of the, in MIT or somewhere. Basically, immediate data, is the coffee machine working? Great, I'll go and get a coffee. So what we do is provide applications that basically it's an open API to allow people to work with any camera stream, obviously assuming you have permission to, to work with it. And I'm just going to give you a short example of some uh, data that we took from Dublin. And this is a data set that was avail has been available on Dublin and CSV file of uh, all the cameras, the Dublin City traffic cameras. The Dublin City traffic cameras, they don't provide what we see normally like a, a, you know, a, a live stream. They only refresh every five minutes. So you're basically, your info you're getting is, is there a traffic jam or not? Should I take that route to work? Should I take the M50 or not? And the way it's presented is uh, on their website like this. So he said, fine, took the file, put it onto our own site, and a little, uh, not quite as stylishly done, but a little like, like building eye, we took it and said, would that data be a little more useful if we could map it? And we can say to people, well, probably what you care about is your route to work, or you care about your immediate vicinity. So let's make it easier for people to spot where the cameras are, show me all the cameras on the N11, the M50, and not only that, but show me additional cameras where Dublin City Council um, and, and I must say, fair play, it's brilliant that this data is out there for us to, to, to play with. But uh, we're saying, well, why not add cameras that are other public cameras, some that are looking at uh, monuments, some that are looking at the, the Dunleary Harbour or the GPO, whatever it might be, and also your own sort of uh, personal cameras. So have them all on the one interface, no matter where, no matter what the source is. So we're kind of hardware agnostic and work with every available camera out there. So for, for example, a client who has our cameras or his own cameras using our platform to watch them on a few different building sites around Dublin can also have the Dublin City traffic cameras on the same format. So when he's deciding, right, uh, I've got to hit a few of these sites today, which route will I take? You know, on the same screen, he's seeing, well, I better get to that building site quickly because they're doing X job soon and that, you know, the M50 is clear. So it's again just giving it back to the user in a nice format. And just to show you a sample of one of our applications, this is an application called Snapmail. It sounds painfully simple, and what it does is very simple, but finding something else to do it is quite tricky. So what Snapmail does is you pick all your relevant cameras, and you say, send me an image from all those cameras at 7 o'clock every morning. Just a JPEG. That's all. Send it by email. And send it to someone who might not necessarily be allowed to access the live view of those cameras. And for our customers, that often means the boss of the 10 stores or showrooms, he gets an email at 8 o'clock every morning, and whoever's store isn't open on time gets a phone call. It's that, and it's, that, it's that simple, and it changes behavior. And with this one here, the example is, okay, show me every morning at 8 o'clock, I'm going to get that mail just before I leave my house, and it's going to show me a combination of my places I have to go for work, and we're taking a JPEG from Dublin City Council's traffic cameras, and it's included there. And I guess what's interesting is the that's camera data, and it's not even live camera data, it's just a JPEG. What's coming along that's really interesting is getting um, access to more cameras. And again, people are always very, you know, ca cameras, it's always, you know, CCTV, this is all negative. But we have to turn that around. You know, the cameras are, are providing valuable data. Everyone thinks the cameras are negative until, you know, a, a child goes missing or, some, or their own bike gets stolen. And then all of a sudden it's, I should have the right to see all the cameras everywhere and let's all, you know, sh show everyone your cameras immediately. And, and that's fine. And there's a balance there. And a lot of the important data isn't on screen. It's not necessarily the camera data. The important data is often the logs of the camera. Who looked at that camera? The camera that's outside your, your house or your apartment block. 
That's a lot less intimidating if the log files are public of who's, no one's ever looked at that camera. There's been no, or whoever downloaded footage from that camera, it was in relation to this incident, related to a pulse incident, it was downloaded by the guards, it was helpful, thanks a million, these are good citizens who share their camera footage when it's requested. That's kind of where we see the excitement. The other little thing is that you'll get data from cameras that isn't as sensitive. So when a camera is, when a camera is counting how many cyclists went by or how, you know, di different data that isn't um, visual, that will become very interesting as a source of data. So, uh, thanks very much. Oh, sorry, the, the, I'll do quickly the, the startup advice you were supposed to, to give. For, <laughs> for us, ours was just start solving a small problem for someone. So our customer at the moment is Dublin City Council, and we tried really, really hard to st solve a little problem of catching people illegal dumping. And that's got us into being a provider there Hopefully that'll lead into some of the more interesting future stuff. So, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Finney. Uh, you got the alarm. Uh, well, she even got away without the alarm. So I set the alarm now. So next up, Patrick Gary from Loyal App. Where's this wee buzzer? Yeah, I'm going the wrong way, am I? There you go. Hey, so my name is Patrick and I'm one of the founders of Loyal App. Uh, our mission at Loyal App really is to connect bricks and mortar businesses with their customers and we do this by means of loyalty and payment applications. The reasoning behind this is, is what we were seeing is that a lot of small to medium sized businesses were becoming increasingly sophisticated with how they were using technology and how they were using data. We're talking about uh, sophisticated reordering software, accountancy software, you know, clock in software for their, for their employees. But when it actually came to the biggest variable and the most important variable for any small business, like their customers, they actually had relatively little idea of what was going on. So our mission was to try and connect these businesses with their customers. Wrong way. So in, in order to do this, we have to start collecting data. So we, we do this at two points. The first point is our initial point of contact with the customer. So that's when a customer walks into this and says, I, I would like to become a member of this loyalty system. I, I like this business. I'm going to join up. So we only require three pretty simple pieces of information. That's their age, uh, their gender, and also their email address. And we use this in combination with transactional data at the point of sale to actually come up with pretty good stuff for the businesses. So, what we give the business comes into two main facets. The first is understanding. So, we give the business a high level understanding of, of how their business is performing, specifically related to their top customers. So, who, who are their to top customers? What are the gender and uh, age breakdowns of our customers? Do we have any lapsed customers? What were the results of the last kind of social campaign that we did? Everything that we can garnish for the business, we try to give back to them in an easy to read, formatable way. That's easy for them to understand. But there's not much point actually telling the businesses if they have a problem uh, unless you can let them act upon that. So that's when the engagement side of Loyal App comes in. So we give businesses the feasibility to reach out to their customers using messages in the application, push notifications, and emails. So in the situation that perhaps they had uh, a customer who used to spend a hell of a lot of their business and hasn't been seen in a while, we give that business the opportunity to reach out to that customer either manually or, or automatically to actually try and get that customer coming back. But uh, arguably, the most interesting part of how we use data is, is how we actually study transactional data from each of the businesses and how we plot it on the curve. So our, our main objective is to try to get all consumer uh, behavior in the shop to actually follow a Gaussian curve. We want it like a normal distribution of customers in any particular business. So if we see in a particular business that it's, it's highly left skewed, and they have a lot of people signed up, but they're coming very infrequently. We'd like to do something, perhaps, and alter their loyalty system or alter the way they do one or two things. Maybe introduce a tiered loyalty system to incentivize customers in the lower echelons to say, you know, if you spend X in, in Y period, you'll become a gold customer. And by becoming a gold customer, you'll get extra bonuses or, or perks or what, whatever the business wants to offer to their customers. Uh, keep going the wrong way. Uh, yeah, I, I made the same mistake in terms of the startup advice and that I misinterpreted it as general advice rather than data advice. But I think that they're loosely applicable as well. Uh, the first is to practice lean. So, converse to what Kieran was saying, we, we had to go lean. Uh, 
but we, we only went lean up until the point that we actually knew what we were doing. So like we were hemming and hawing about different aspects and different features until we actually found something that business owners are like, yes, this is what we want, this works. So now we're kind of getting out of that sort of mentality to an extent, but without it at the start, we would have run out of money and failed. Uh, the other thing is building the right team. So the way I see it is, is any startup is gonna fail if they run out of money or they don't have the right team. That is, they give up themselves. So if you have the right team, even if everything else isn't going right, you have, you know, we know that we have the resources to do this in-house. We know we don't have a huge skills gap and we know that we can all get along together fine. So that was one of the huge important aspects for Lloyd. And, and the third one for us was to just be as close as humanly possible to your customers without freaking them out. So like, uh, I like to spend a lot of time in the businesses that use Lloyd App, look at how they're actually using it, talk to the business owners, and I'd say about 50% of, of developments and functionality that we actually have in the application aren't our own. They're, they're stuff that I was hearing off every single business saying, we really want this, this would really help us. And because we've connected the businesses to the customers with a loyalty application, we were able to do it. Thanks. Excellent, thank you very much, and with 20 seconds to spare. Perfect. <laughs> so next up we have Joseph Borza from Energy Elephant. Hi, my name is Joe Borza, I'm the co-founder of Energy Elephant. Uh, thanks very much Dublin for inviting us to speak today. Um, we spoke at a recent enough event. Um, first of all, I want everyone to go visit our site. It's what every startup should say when they visit uh, any event. You know, we're here to try and get people to try our system and to give it a go. Um, what do you see when you look at this? This is kind of our pitch slide when we're pitching what we do. Um, some people see the 1.3 billion dark areas of the planet. Um, that's primarily people who don't have access to electricity um, or, or safe, clean uh, heating fuels. Um, others see the 1.8 billion uh, light spots that are on the planet at night, and that's the 1.8 billion uh, electricity and gas claims that essentially exist on the planet today. Uh, what we in energy often see is uh, 1.8 billion very confused people as they receive their energy bill and have no idea what it's actually saying, apart from they have to pay it. Um, so that's the kind of problem we're trying to solve. Um, we're all about data. We don't do any hardware. So it's a, it's a real differentiator for what we do versus what most of the competition do. Um, we don't care if you have submeters or if you have lots of tech already installed physically in the place. We just want your data. We just want your energy data and we'll do clever things with it. And our initial offering, uh, like the lads were saying, from a lean perspective is, we just take your energy bills and we extract the data from them. We have an app, so users can take a photo of their electricity or gas meter, or as some people are trying out their water meter currently. Um, and basically we get a meter reading and we're creating new data that way. We have meter reading data that your supplier doesn't know about. So we know more about how you're using energy than your supplier does, generally speaking. Um, we pull in historic data, if you have big Excel files full of energy data that's from some other project or whatever, we try and pull that in, we try and process it to add it to what we get. Um, and then we come into our platform and we pull in data from, from everywhere. Uh, and some of this is built, some of it is being built, and some of it is nice vision stuff. But essentially, the, the, the key stuff we pull in is weather data. So we look at what the weather was like within the, uh, the location of your business or organization. Um, we look at the cost data, so we look at the cost data within your actual bills, but also within the market. So we look at what the other suppliers out there might be able to provide you with. Um, location data, so where you're geographically located. Uh, smart grid data, so we pull in data from uh, this, the, the grid. So we know how much renewable energy is in your mix, how much carbon is actually being emitted on a real-time basis of what you're being emitted. Um, as opposed to most systems currently give you a, a factor that you multiply over the year versus how many electricity you've used, which is, you know, figure in the air type stuff, we're actually looking at what's actually happening. So if you use most of your electricity at night time, you're using more renewable energy, basically, because there's lower demand. Uh, we look at benchmark data, so we look at how you compare to your competitors or uh, your peers, and that's used to kind of gamify it, to try and influence you to change your behavior and use energy better. And finally, we can pull in some other data sources, such as 
uh, building energy rating data. So you've probably seen BERs. If you're renting a house or buying a house, you've probably seen an A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, so we try and pull in some of that type of data. Uh, currently, there's certain uh, restrictions under open dataness with that type of stuff. So that's something we'd, we'd need to build on, especially on the consumer side. And then the far side, we, we push out reports. So we show you every month, you get an update of how you're doing. Uh, you get a live dashboard of what you're spending. Our, our key thing we show our users is, over the next five years, you're going to spend this much money on your energy bills. And we find that really focuses the minds. Uh, there was one pub that was spending, was going to spend just shy of 200,000 euros over five years on energy bills. And when we first spoke to them, they weren't interested in it. And we said, hey, just give us the data and we'll, we'll show you some interesting stuff back. As soon as they got that figure, it really focused the minds. Um, and we store all the data for the, for the organization. So one of the problems we find is that if someone changes job or a different road or something, all this historic data for, on energy stuff for these businesses essentially disappears. It doesn't quite disappear. It sits on an Excel file somewhere on someone's desktop until it eventually disappears into the ether. Um, so open data, easier access to the meter data would be great for us. In the US there's a thing called the green button um, and this is more of a consumer side of things but essentially you can click it and your supplier will have to provide your data to whoever you want in a standard format. And basically it means that there's lots of startups in the US who are taking this data and doing clever stuff with it. In Ireland and in Europe in general, there's nothing like that. Um, but it would be a great first step to getting some of the energy data out there uh, so that people can do stuff that's clever and help people with stuff. Um, there's a lot of inertia in this area though, so it's difficult. Um, advice for startups? Uh, I would say watch the Back to the Future trilogy. <laughs> um, it'll give you some great ideas about what's coming down the track. Uh, and a, a great quote, which I've actually completely robbed from um, a Harvard uh, Business Review podcast that I listened to, was you can always make more money, you can never make more time. And that was for when startups become successful, uh, the presenter was saying that they don't work with certain companies and they don't work with certain individuals. And they said, because my time is more precious than my money. And therefore, I'm going to focus on the customers that I can bring the most value to and also who align with the core values of what it is that the, the company does and the mission is for a startup. And I would say that for every startup, is, is stay true to your, your core mission. Um, you can be a little fuzzy on the areas when you're trying to get revenue in at the beginning and stuff, but you really do have to stick to your guns and make sure you, you know what you're going to do and, and stick to that the whole way through. So, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much, Joe. So, next up, we have Neil Turner with uh, Bus Nearby and PowerTech. Thanks, Neil. So, that's me. Um, for some reason, I decide to develop on the platforms that aren't liked as much, so I develop on Xbox. Well, actually, that's quite popular, but Windows Phone is the, one of the, the lesser popular phone platforms. Uh, in fact, does anyone here actually use Windows Phone at all? Usually one or two? Yay, two, <laughs> three. Okay, that's good. That's slightly better than the average, anyway. So um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking about just, just two of the apps. Um, there are equivalents on other, other platforms as well, which I'll, which I'll mention. So the first one is Bus Nearby, and of course, both these apps use open data. Um, of course, the funny thing about this data is it usually doesn't start off open. Um, Dublin Bus do have an old legacy endpoint, which I, this app still uses, but we're, I'll be transferring over to Dublin at some point. But essentially, that's there, and we've no terms of service for it, but pretty much all of the unofficial bus apps and all the platforms use it. So it's, it's, pretty, it's a strange one. But anyway, it's, the app has been working well, the data's been working well, and it's, it's quite popular. And I think with a lot of these kinds of public transport apps that appear, it, it fills a need that either the official app doesn't do, or in the case of Windows Phone, the official app doesn't exist. So it was uh, quite important at times. So it's been running for, actually, yeah, it's, it's pretty much its, app, the, it's, it's, uh, its third birthday, if I can count. So it's uh, been, running, running, been running well, and it's a, it's a popular app. Um, then we have PowerCheck. So PowerCheck is the ESB app that basically allows you to find out where the power outages are and if they're going to be fixed and if there's going to be one in your area soon. Those, this app actually does exist on iOS and Android officially. It does not exist on Windows Phone officially, but it now exists unofficially. Um, this is, again, one of these situations where there's no... I, well, yes, I do have unofficially on there. So... There is no API, there is a website that has data, so my app uses that same data. I hope that's okay. I haven't got a cease and desist yet, so that's good. But that's, that's sometimes the way things go, and 
for the most part, most companies over here, uh, semi-state and otherwise, have been pretty good about their data. Like we've, we've had no cease and desists over Dublin bus and things like that, so it's been pretty good. But essentially, these apps just are handy to use and they're quick. And you know, I'm sure more, more people use the bus app than they do the power outage app, but they're still useful and uh, they're, they're kind of good to have. Um, so I just wanted to kind of breeze through those kind of quickly because uh, I'm kind of more interested in sort of giving the advice on the, the technical side and the data. So one kind of improvement that, that I would like is there's one huge difference that we have in data is you'll notice all the bus signs outside and when there's diversions and strikes and things like that, they usually tell you about this. Well, unfortunately, the apps can't because that data is not there for us and we don't even get the stop, uh, there, we don't even get the, the street data in, in Irish. So there's a lot of... There's a lot of differences between the sort of the official side of things versus the, the unofficial side. So it'd be nice to see that kind of change so that when there's a bus strike, our, our app can actually say that. Because if you're a tourist and you visit Dublin and you use an unofficial app, you will simply just get no bus times. There's, there, there's no other way of knowing. So that's, you know, that's not, that's not great. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier, an update schedule for the data will be nice. The Dublin bus one is, is interesting because we, we can get data from the API, and those calls are obviously they're live. We you know you can call the data right now, but we have but when a bus route changes, how long will that take to to update that data? We have no idea, so it's a guess. So that that kind of thing can be tricky because both the official apps and the unofficial apps can suffer because you have someone saying that oh this particular bus route doesn't exist anymore or why doesn't this bus stop work? And it's not our fault. It's just the data hasn't changed yet. So little you know little pointers as to maybe how often will be will be nice. Um, and again, going with that with street names, there are street names that are misspelt, which is kind of amazing because there's only a few thousand of them, so you kind of think someone would check them. But there are mistakes, so it would be nice if you could report those spelling mistakes, things like that. And uh, also, again, API status is very important. If you have an API, please have a status page. Things go wrong. It would be nice to know if they are going wrong or is it just me, is it just my internet connection or something like that. Um, again, all the bigger providers, Twitter, Instagram, GitHub, they all have API status pages, so please, API status pages if you have an API. Um, from the general advice I would give to people making APIs, um, hopefully, if you're in any way technical, you're looking at this stuff and it's like, oh yes, that's, we already do that stuff. But this stuff is very important. Essentially, the data should be compressed, so it's smaller. That means things are faster. Um, the format, JSON, that's the standard. If you have something called SOAP, you're bad. Get away from SOAP. It's really old. If someone says you should use SOAP, they did that in the 90s. Don't. It's JSON is now. Everyone is JSON. Um, again, SSL, um, I mentioned because it's increasingly more important that any kind of communication that you make on any network is secure and encrypted. It doesn't matter, even if it is open data, it should be over SSL. And the cost of SSL is pretty much non-existent now for most, most providers. So please, where possible, use SSL. And even though I'm someone who consumes APIs, do have API limiting because unfortunately there'll always be one or two people who take advantage of your API. Don't assume that just because you make it, everyone will respect it. So have API limits, have tokens. Um, I'm perfectly happy because again, with Twitter and so on, you apply for a token. If you abuse that, they'll cut you off. So, so if you're gonna make your data open or again, even if you have private API, think about these things because most of the unofficial apps, again, the bus ones and so on, we reverse engineer. So, you know, given the fact your API is private, that doesn't really stop us um, getting access to your data. And then finally, this is more just a general design thing um, from kind of apps and websites. Uh, gone are the days when you make a separate website for a desktop and a separate website for mobile. Think in terms of responsive designs that scale multiple screens because apps and websites have actually been going that way for the last number of years. Apps on iOS, Android, and Windows, they're all going that way. So again, think of responsive over many screen sizes. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Neil. Okay, do we have uh, Nula? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Very good. Okay, so next up is Nula Canning from Frampa. Um, okay, um, so uh, let me begin by saying that uh, we are a customer loyalty and rewards agency. So we essentially design and manage loyalty programs. Um, and I guess from just listening today, I suppose what we would say is that we probably use open data to create programs that create closed data. Um, and, and I have to, <laughs> so I don't know how well that's going to be received, but, and, and I, I could certainly two uh, programs that we would uh, have been involved in where we would have used, uh, we would have had to try and access as much open data as possible. One was regarding um, Dublin Bus, and, and the other was regarding a student program. And I say Dublin Bus because it was a tender uh, that we were invited to, um, to respond to uh, in terms of building a case for a loyalty program because that is the starting point for any company if they're going to look at a loyalty program is, you know, what, what is the end result? Is this ultimately going to uh, maintain our customers and, uh, and obviously uh, maintain and grow revenue? Uh, 
So, uh, in terms of when we're, we're starting the process of, um, of building a case, the, the first thing we need to be able to do is to determine um, when you're building a loyalty program, is it going to help retain existing customers? Is it going to acquire new customers? Is it going to move customers up the segments? What I mean by that is it going to get them to spend more, essentially. Um, increase the customer lifetime value, which is um, a metric that has become increasingly important with, uh, regarding loyalty programs. So it's from the, from the moment a company or a customer or a consumer engages with your product right through to the time that they, they no longer do. Um, obviously getting, winning back uh, defected customers and creating advocates. So um, I, I was a little bit reluctant then because I, I think when I heard Loyal Lapped, I'm not quite sure if Loyal Lapped is a, is a competitor or a, if it complements our business, but essentially what we do is we build loyalty programs where we, um, so, so two companies that come to mind at the moment that we're talking to, where they have no data at all on their customers. They, they're both in the retail business, they're both businesses that, that if I was to say who they were, you, you, you would know who they are and they have absolutely no information on their customers. It's, they're both retail, it's transaction driven. So what we do essentially is, is we, we build a platform, um, we use an API, we very simply integrate into the repos system. Um, we, can, we can either distribute loyalty cards essentially, so as soon as a customer comes in and starts to purchase, uh, we're able to capture everything on that data in terms of their basket value, what they bought, how much they bought, when they bought, etc. And as a result of that information, then we use that to try and motivate them ultimately to spend more. Um, and, and one of the whole ideas then is, is try and move them up that process. I mean, we look at reporting, you know, what happened? You know, what happened today? Um, why did it happen? What's happening now? And more importantly, are we able to predict, um, you know, how a consumer will engage with the product in the future? And what actions can we take in order to sure, ensure that they behave in a more profitable way? And then finally, I think what's very important in terms of the data we use is that we're constantly obviously looking at the, at the ROI of a program to justify its existence. So again, looking at the data that we gather, we look at activity rate, the percentage of members actively involved in the program, uh, ultimate, re uh, ultimate redemption rates. And what I mean by that is how many people are redeeming points, uh, breakage points, uh, cost per redeemed point versus cost uh, per point, inactivity period, why is the customer not being back uh, to the program and how can we motivate them to come back again? Uh, right through to um, to looking at, I suppose, the overall um, the overall, overall ROI of that program, and to see, you know, what has the investment, I suppose, in terms of the cost of that program um, delivered. Let's say the end results, which is ultimately growing the business. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Nola. Um, next up. I suppose this fits more into the, probably the social entrepreneurship uh, <laughs> model is Owen McGuirk with uh, to talk about food cloud. I am the same guy who was talking about the CSO, so <laughs> some people were in there, the CSO. Uh, so what's food cloud? So the idea of food cloud is it's uh, an app and uh, it's connecting people who have too much with people who have too little. Now you're lucky, you have the good looking uh, presenter here today. These are the two girls here <laughs> who founded Food Cloud, so neither Isolt or even could be here. So I'm the chair of the board of Food Cloud. So we know from the statistics, like what is the issue that we're talking about? So a million tons of food is wasted every year in Ireland. And we know one in 10 Irish people suffer food poverty. Those are current statistics. It's actually higher than that now. Uh, we know one in five kids goes to school, are bed hungry every day. So the challenge is to say, look, we have all of these people going hungry, and then on the other side, we have all this perfectly good food going to waste. How can we move that surplus food to where there is the need? And that was the idea of Food Cloud. So what Food Cloud does is it connects somebody who has the surplus food with a charity that is distributing the food and then the charity distributes it to the people who need it. So what we are doing is it's just a logistical solution. So you're connecting uh, using a smartphone app. So say at the end of the day, you're a supermarket, you look on your shelves and you say, this is what I have left. You just generally type it into the app so it's not very specific, you'll show and you're saying, look, I have this amount of quantity, and uh, this is where I am, come and get it. It goes up into the cloud, gets offered to all of the different uh, charities, and the first charity says, yeah, I can go and get that. They go and collect it. 
So it's very, very simple. The advantage is you don't need lots of logistics. All you're doing is using a phone, getting a text message, answering the text message, go and collect the food. So since we've started this, uh, we've last July, about a million meals have been moved to charity. So it's very, very simple. This is what it looks like. So here's a guy in uh, Tesco. And what he's doing is, you can see this is what the screen, you get post a donation or view a donation, track your whatever it is. And he just says, oh, I have a bit of this, I have a bit of that, I have a bit of the other. And he puts in the kilo quantity. And then you can say, oh yeah, I'm interested in doing that. So some people might have loads of bakery, they don't need any bakery, they have a relationship with somebody who already has bakery, they drop it into their charity every day. They're, they mightn't be interested in that. So the app is smart, it knows, hang on, I'm not gonna offer that to these guys because that's bakery, they don't want it. So in the background of the app, you have pieces of information about what sort of different food the different charities that you have want. You'll know whether they have fridges or freezers or whether they're just interested in ambient food. So there's an example of uh, one there. If you can collect 26 kilos of bakery bread, carrots, it names it from Tesco Comets, the Pips Bread gives you the day, and off you go and gives you a bit of information. There's a number there, you just accept the number and you say, I'm going to go and get it. So by April 2015, so this is uh, since July of last year, we've moved 335 tons of food, it's equivalent to 800,000 meals, and we're working with 300 plus charities. Uh, the advantage to the business is they were throwing it out. It was actually costing them money. So it's 150 euro a ton to throw out the food. You don't get anything for throwing out that food. And then the charities, uh, they are all stretched at the minute. So most of the charities, uh, their budgets have been hit up to 30%. So what you're doing is you're, uh, it's a win-win. The business gets, uh, it saves money on its waste, and it, um, it, it, it's helping in the process. And then the charity gets the food. So you can see, here's the Bretzel Bakery here. It tells exactly how much the Bretzel Bakery, how many deliveries it got, what it got, or how many deliveries it gave, what it gave, and uh, who got it. So the vision is, uh, we're still working on our, we're on our third MVP, so the minimal viable product, so we're on our third version of it. We want to in, uh, get the solution better, develop and manage the technology. We're moving into the UK, uh, 3,300 stores we've been asked to do in the UK. We first pilot in London the last two weeks and build a more sustainable, efficient model. The open data, we don't know where the food waste is in Ireland. We don't know the food businesses that have it, and we don't know who the food charities are. It would be good to be able to find them. And the advice, uh, I like this thing about Thomas Edison. He tried 10,000 different battery prototypes before he actually got the right one. And a journalist asked him, uh, how, how could you keep going, failing 10,000 times one after the other? And he said, well, he didn't look at it like that. He said, I didn't fail. Every time the thing didn't work, I learned that that wasn't the way to do it, so I just tried something else. So if you're starting up something, you know, uh, we've learned a lot in the last year. You can look at that as we've failed a lot in the last year, but we look at that as that we've learned a lot. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Owen. So, Last speaker in this session, Donald Butler from Public Policy. Hi, um, Public Policy, what is it? It's an independent think tank, uh, fully supported by Atlantic Philanthropies. We're not selling anything, we give it away uh, for nothing. What we did was um, developed a, an application on local authority finance, because the local government system, in our experience, was extremely opaque. Uh, I've had an interest in it all my life, but it was very hard to get the information. So we built this application. We launched it in May 2014 to coincide with the local elections. And it aimed to show local authority spending and revenue, and it gave us a facility to compare um, each local authority with every other one or the national, or the national average. Uh, up to five, you can compare it to up to five different um, applications. 
the information was very difficult to access. It took us a fair bit of actually grunt work to ring up local authorities. Uh, some of them wondered, what do you want this for? Um, why do you want it? Who are you? All that stuff. Uh, others were much more. So it took a fair bit of, 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 of um, effort to, to, to uh, do it. It was the first time the information was available in this form. And uh, we got at least some positive feedback. We won a web award for the application uh, last, last October. Uh, it's clear appetite for information in the form. It's 60,000 page views. This is not a mass market um, thing. Interesting, 15% was, was outside Ireland. And most intriguingly, we seem to get a disproportionate amount of traffic from Brazil. What they want to know about Irish local authorities is just um, <laughs> Uh, got a bit of positive feedback. One junior minister told me that it enabled him to see how inefficient his local authority was. And a member of the Senate says it was very helpful in that he was able to find out quickly how much was spent on the arts right across the system. Um, the usage has settled down. I think we've got a group of core users, I think mainly in local authorities, who are actually using this, this stuff now. And we're, we're updating it. Um, advice. Um, I find it very hard to give advice. My, my only advice is that if you're looking for information from the public sector, the first thing to do is ask. You know, it's very simple, actually. If you ask, you ask and you shall receive. Knock on the door, it shall be opened. Uh, thank you very much. So, essentially, if we open it up now to questions, and there's a microphone here as well, if anybody, so... Questions, anybody, for any of the speakers? Yeah, here we have one here, uh, Henry. Uh, <coughs> Pass it. <laughs> Show. You're developing a solution, um, and you got down the road of building a prototype or demo. Or, um, is the government department you're dealing with going to turn around and say, well, look, sorry, uh, it's been great working with you, but we're going to have to put this out to tender and get three quotes, et cetera, et cetera? I do know it is something that Enterprise Ireland are looking at actively in terms of it, and particularly there, there is a mechanism, small business innovation, so that they're doing some piloting with that to see that, that an alternative mechanism to the pure tendering process, particularly for innovative products. Uh, but I suppose if they're traditional ones and there's already a market there, it's usually the tendering process. So Enterprise Ireland are definitely doing work in this space to try and make it more open for startups in particular to compete with government business. Okay, any other questions for any of the speakers? Here we go. Here. The local authority has stuff up on the site and it has all the information, including the, the applicant's name and everything else, and you want to make that available and you can't actually transfer that onto your own site because presumably it's going onto a different server and you're not entitled to have it. So you have to do a reference to it. Um, does anyone feel that this is a sort of a, a, a silly gap in the, in the data protection, given that the information is already effectively out there? And it's, it's, it's the same information, but it's just saying, we have it, it was given to us for a purpose, and you can't have it even if it's for a related purpose. Um, okay, so by law, So that was a clear focus as to how we could 
just go ahead. Now, when you go on further, you can say, once you have your data, you can talk to the local authorities and say, how do you differentiate between a private applicant and somebody who has a business? So let's just say it's Tesla. So you can actually hold the data on Tesla and their address, and you're not in breach of data protection. But at this stage, the local authorities aren't able to do that, or within their system, they can't, they can't do that. Now, they probably can have features that when somebody's logging an application, they can go private, and then commercial. And in, in that case, you can actually pull the data down and break down, take away applicant's name, the private room, show them. My, my, my question really was, is there a potential lobby out there for changing the data protection, <laughs> <laughs> protection rules? Well, okay. you, can, you can go to the local authority site and see my name. But what they don't want to do is give that out. And I think it's better that they don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else for with questions for any of our speakers, including the very startups? If there's, okay, there's one over here. Thanks. I wasn't too sure whether to ask this question, but there's one thing that kind of um, kind of left off the page. Earlier on, one of the speakers was talking about Dublin bikes and the ability that they, were, they did 700 kilometers of cycling, um, the tracking stations, and all that information. Then we had the photograph app earlier on, which um, basically showed real-time cameras, and it made me think, um, when we're looking at the Google Maps and all that, the, 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 uh, when you're looking at locations, license plates and things like that are always blacked out, so there's an anonymity there. The data sets that we're getting, a lot of data sets here are, are anonymized. As we kind of move towards more of these public open cameras, and I appreciate you, you, you touched on it earlier on, there is an element of all these open datas um, in their own may not uh, have a personal security issue, but when you combine a lot of them there, especially if they're all open data, and someone comes there, it's not a huge leap forward to go to mystalker.app in terms of tracking someone, whether they're going from work to home, whether they're really sick, um, and a whole host of other areas. I'm, I'm maybe being a little facetious here, but I'm just saying, where should we draw the line in these? In, I mean, the data protection commissioner, I'm assuming, is in charge of the, the data that comes out there, but who's, is there going to be any regulation of how that material is actually used? Or where should the line be? Any of our speakers want to <laughs> grab that? I'm sure it is. Just from the point of view, maybe to give an idea of what the CSO does. So the CSO has data out there. It allows access to data. It's anonymized microdata files. So they've done this exercise to anonymize the file. But what they do is, if you are somebody who wants to do research and access the data, then we record that, we put that up on the website so everybody is able to see who took this data, uh, what variables were, there, were they allowed, what, what time periods, and what was the re piece of research that they were doing. So then anybody is able to look at that and say, well, this person or this organization has taken 20 different sets of that data set which makes it then less uh, confidential than it was before. So I think to answer that question there, to help with that situation, I think if people are getting data that is open, it should be recorded that they've done that, and then somebody's able to see, are they abusing that? And I, I think that's really an easy thing to do. Vinny, have you any comment? You, you've obviously thought about this in terms of <laughs> as you're working with the cameras. <laughs> um, it, I, the Dublin Bikes example is really good because we have a camera that's belonging to a customer, which is looking perfectly at a Dublin bike stand. And we haven't done it yet, but we've looked at the idea of, great, let's get the data from that stand and we can match a picture with each event. But the, the, it would have to be with permission. And we, we, we couldn't post up, you know, it's, it's a public space, people it couldn't be posted with people being recognizable and identifiable. So it's more like uh, an opt-in scenario where, and I, you, you do it, it, ha it happens when you, when you go skiing, for example, it's the same idea. You can say, take a picture of me at all these points, and I'll have my pictures at the end of the, the, the day or the end of the trip. If there was a button on my Dublin Bikes app that said, do you want a photo of, of you every time your card's used, and they know which point you're at, in theory, down the line, it wouldn't be quite easy now, but you could blur out the faces of everyone else in the picture and just send me the pictures of me. And again, why not also, you, uh, my picture's getting taken every time my, you know, 
my bank link card is used. Give me those pictures too. Give me all the pictures of, of me, but don't give them to everybody else. Like it shouldn't be possible for you to locate um, locate pictures of me and my Dublin bikes data. That w would be uh, a bit risky on that. But I think you're you're right in the sense that the stalker app is closer to you know the, it's a legitimate fear. I think. My concern is that where I'm thinking of, okay, and uh, maybe go with a narrative. You break, your girl breaks up with psycho ex-boyfriend. Psycho ex-boyfriend happened to have the username for the Gmail account, of which silly person has recorded their Dublin bikes password, their maybe have their, that has the password to their Evernote where they've recorded all the other passwords they need for logging in to their clock-ins to everything else because they have 50 passwords to remember. Person then goes on, uses the open apps that are, that are being there to track. The person is traveling from home to work, the bicycle data, how many times they've crossed the M50 on the toll booth. You can build up a certain map of, of these things. Now, I know we're being a bit enemy of the stages here. I'm not trying to be paranoid. But I'm just saying, in five years' time, the amount of cameras are exponentially getting bigger time after time. Um, it's not inconceivable that in a few years' time, this, if, the, if someone's careless with their passwords, that this access is going to be very, very open for anyone to track their movements. And I'm just wondering what protections really should be putting in place there. You know, you can't protect against stupidity, so you have to maybe sometimes put other protections to safeguard against it. Yeah. I, thank you. Joe, you want to? Um, I suppose just some follow-up to that. Like, I suppose one thing we should also be thinking about is the, um, the types of data that are going to become available in the next number of years. I mean, from our perspective, there's going to be smart grids, uh, smart meters put into everyone's homes. And like from our perspective, it's brilliant. You know, we can say, you know, all the interesting things you do with your energy, how we can make you, you know, use it better. But we spoke to a marketing person, and they were like, "So you can tell me what time they get out of bed at, and what time they have their shower, and what time they have their breakfast at, what time they watch television at? That's amazing. I want that data." <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, do you know what I mean? From from our perspective, we don't want to give that data out to people. It, it's not available in Ireland yet, but it is available in other other countries. Um, but there is, you're right, there is a line, I suppose. Like, I suppose from our perspective, the, the great analogy we think of is like weather data. You know, no one really cares who has the weather data. Like, quick show of hands here, who uses the YOR.no app for weather? And quick show of hands, who uses MetAirns? Okay, there you go. <laughs> That's just, uh, like, it just shows one company use it, or one state agency putting the data out in a really usable format, and then another one that doesn't quite do it quite as well. Um, but then, like you were saying, the private data side of things, where it's personally attributable to a person, um, it's going to become more and more complex. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming Facebook and Google are doing things with data, probably not attributable directly to your person, um, but they probably group you with a few others that are in a similar kind of category and kind of overcome it that way. But it, it is something we should all be aware of and be thinking about, especially from our perspective. The, we think the smart meter data where you can track exactly what people are doing in their homes. I mean, after the Irish water meters, you know, what's going on there, it's, it's only going to get more tricky to sort these kind of things out. Okay. Yeah. We're going to have to wrap it up now, so go I'll ahead. Just very quick. Last just, I think the, the key point of the example was the, the human error of the password being missing. And every few months there's a big story in, in the Daily Mail of all the CCTV cameras that got hacked around Ireland. And it's always the same thing. It's the default usernames and passwords were left on the, the device, and that's when cameras get hacked. So I think it's 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 a bigger issue, and it, it is it will also be a lot clearer technology-wise. You will know if someone's logging into your accounts from a device that you haven't given permission to log in. I think the, the technology is catching up with the threat of it, and the info's probably on Facebook anyway of where your ex is, not yours in particular. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the important thing is that we continue to have the conversation and that we just don't let the topic slide so that as we progress we have the conversation and ensure that we're doing something about putting safeguards in place for this sort of thing. And as was mentioned, in some cases we give this type of data away to people and a lot of it, that a lot of things could be done with. Um, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much to Kieran and to all of our speakers. Excellent. Um,